cansızlardan canlı sistemlere geçiş konu başlıklı sunumunu yapmak üzere Güney Danimark Üniversitesi Fizik, Kimya ve Eczacılık Enstitüsü ve Temel Yaşam Teknoloji Merkezi'nde öğretim üyesi olarak görev yapmakta olan Profesör Doktor Martin Hanchis'i kürsüye davet ediyoruz. Invite Professor Dr. Martin Hansitz, uh, sorry, Hansitz, uh, to the stage. Hansitz currently works at the University of Southern Denmark at the Institute for Physics, Chemistry and Pharmacy, and he will now present us his presentation, namely Protocells and Early Earth: The Transition from Non-Living to Living Systems. Can you hear me back there? Yes. Good? Great. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Actually, it's wonderful that the student group here has invited me to come to university. Actually, you sent me the email and I think just very soon after, maybe the same day, I wrote back and said, yes, I'm definitely coming. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here and to support uh, what you're doing here at this university, to support science, basically doing something that's a bit unusual and maybe not even in your curriculum to support science, not only for yourselves, but for the younger generations that are to come. And it's efforts like this that are really going to have a major impact on the world and, and on science in particular. So thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So now we'll get to work and talk a little bit about science. This is, a, this is a scientific presentation. Um, I know many people here tonight are not experts in this field. Um, uh, and there's going to be quite a lot of this sort of main story that you'll be able to understand from this lecture, even if you're not an expert. Uh, but for completeness, there will be a little bit of sort of the technical detail for those who are really interested in how these systems work. I'll go through those slides a bit quickly, but at least they'll be there so you can see uh, a bit of the mechanistic detail of what we're, we're speaking about here tonight. But basically, my research for the last few years has focused on trying to understand something about life. And uh, the way I do it is from a scientific and experimental perspective. And this has led me to work with this system called protocells. And I'll explain what I mean in a moment by protocells and how this relates to a scenario that seems related to uh, uh, the early Earth in the beginning of life. So that's where we're going with this. I currently work in... Um, oops, I tried to advance the slides here. One moment. Good. I currently work in Denmark, University of Southern Denmark, um, and it's at a research um, center called FLINT. It stands for Fundamental Living Technology, and there are various aspects of this research center. And we are primarily interested in developing artificial life models to study living systems. That means make something, something man-made, uh, something artificial that then could help us understand something about real living systems. And this also relates somewhat then to scenarios that are commensurate with the origin of life. Um, we have diverse interests also in, say, in engineering, uh, in new materials, for example, developing soft robotics, and I will speak a bit about motility today. Smart materials and intelligent systems, which I won't speak much about. We also have custom chemical synthesis for making chemicals that we need, and also a very large group doing theory simulation and modeling of these kinds of systems, which is important for our research. But I'm an experimentalist, so all the stuff you'll see about you'll see here today is stuff that I uh, actually have done in the laboratory. And just as a bit of background, Denmark is a, a little flat country of only five million people, and it has like, lots of flowers and colors that look like this, which is really nice. Um, we are the world's leading producer of wind turbines, so there's a lot of uh, wind power being generated in Denmark. And um, I come from a small town, I live in a small town called Udense, which is where Hans Christian Andersen was born. He was the author of The Little Mermaid and other fairy tales. So it's a fairy tale-like town where I'm, where I'm living. And it's not always looks like this. This is a picture I took. Uh, drive, this is riding to the university. This is my bicycle here. And I thought it'd be funny just to take a picture to show my friends. Basically, we get uh, quite a lot of uh, winter weather there for too many months out of the year, six months or more out of the year, we get really cold weather. 
which could be fun, but also quite uh, tedious, uh, I would say. So, that's a little introduction to where I am now. Um, before I talk to you about this crazy science that I'm doing, I'll give you a bit of background about myself. I'm actually trained as a biologist. And I went to uh, university, Penn State University in Pennsylvania here, where I worked on biology and population genetics, basically Drosophila melanogaster genetics. And um, from there I went to a PhD program at Yale University where I switched to studying a different kind of evolution, uh, in vitro evolution. So basically putting molecules in test tubes, mutating them and then selecting them for different functionalities and showing kind of an in vitro version of evolution that you can do in the laboratory. And that's what I did for my PhD, which is in genetics. So that's why it's nice that I was invited to this conference on evolution, because that's really where my roots are, even though you'll see I'm not really working with genetics much anymore. But that's where my heart is. And then I switched, when I went to do a postdoc at Harvard with Jack Shawstack, I really switched gears to something really different and started working on supermolecular chemistry. This means how molecules self-assemble, so single molecules can self-assemble into much larger aggregates and uh, looking at the dynamic structures that are formed from that. And I will be speaking in the first part of the talk about this work that I did here, which basically has very little to do with, with genetics, but perhaps, perhaps something to do with evolution, especially the very early stages of evolution. So here's the outline of what we'll get through today. I'll introduce you to this concept of protocells, what we're speaking about here. And then I will present two protocell models one is based on uh, lipid membranes or vesicles, and the other one is based on droplets. Okay? Then I'll end up uh, with a uh, little bit about some outreach that I'm doing, and then, of course, conclude for the day. So we'll go through quite a lot of little, little bits here. And like I said, some of it is going to be technical, and some of it will not be. Um, just to kind of start the discussion, uh, we, of course, start with this very small question, what is life here in the corner? When I was studying evolution, I'm really curious, you know, what is this that I'm studying? What is it that's evolving here? And it's not an easy question to answer, and actually no one, I think, has come up with a very good, satisfactory answer about defining life. But we can consider, just by observation, you know, with scientists observing the real world, and noting that biology seems to have a certain amount of order to it, right? It's not just chaotic. There's quite a lot of order, for example, in the DNA and everything else. So um, we can consider then natural systems that are non-living that also have quite a bit of order. You know, crystals are natural, you'll find these out there, and they have a very regular atomic structure, right? This is very good order that comes out of the natural systems. Through physics, for example, that you can get this. And physics and chemistry will give you nice ordered structures here. And on the other side we have this ordered structure, which is this, this crazy looking cat which could be representative, representative of living things that we would say, yeah, well, this is probably alive and this crystal is, is likely not alive. And um, really kind of playing with this idea, what is, the, the, what is it that distinguishes life from non-life, right? And what can we even say about this thing? And it seems like research in the last few decades, certainly longer to 100 years, kind of blur this distinction a bit as we're noticing more and more about how living systems are arranged and, and behave and also looking at how non-living systems are arranged and behave, we can then begin to think that there's a more of a continuum that could exist between the non-living structures here and the living structures over here. And the work that I'm talking about today is investigating this gray area in between uh, non-living and living systems, where basically we take non-living components here and we try to create something in the laboratory that has some living property to it. That's, that's really the basic thing. And that thing that we're creating are protocells here, and now which I'll speak about. So, this, is, and this involves the creation of new materials and technologies with lifelike properties. And now, uh, we have to be careful what we mean by lifelike, which I'll explain as well. This protocell idea, in my view, a protocell is an artificial, this is, so this is man-made, chemical model of a living cell. And it's um, a bit of a challenge to do this because we can consider that a natural living cell has on the order of a million different types of molecules in it, right? And they are related to each other in a complex network that needs to then produce something that has lifelike properties. And we hope 
in the laboratory that we can produce something that looks like life based on a huge decrease in complexity, basically on the order of tens of different types of molecules that can basically do the same job. So I don't, we don't even know if this is possible, right? But this is the kind of the thinking that goes into this. It's a highly reductionist approach to, to understanding living systems. But it's tractable then in the laboratory because this is very complex. As you, those of you studying biology, molecular biology, you know this is a very complex system here. We're trying to get to simpler systems that could then teach us about these complex systems, and we hope we can do that. This is similar in thinking to this term synthetic biology, which is very, very popular these days. You know, there's a student iGEM competition, for example. Have any, has anyone heard of iGEM here? Yeah, so we have an iGEM team already this year as well from SDU, from my university. Um, it's very popular right now to re-engineer bacteria, for example, to do some functions. Um, but what I'll be talking about is not really that. It's the more classical definition of synthetic, bi synthetic biology that uh, Stefan Le Duc here, 1911, said, like other sciences, synthetic biology must proceed from the simpler to the more complex, beginning with the reproduction of the more elementary vital phenomena. So that's how we start. Simple, and then we try to get more and more complex and see where that takes us. So we're not starting with cells, right? I'm not starting these experiments with anything that is a living cell, not even extracted from a living cell. This is all synthesis from chemistry. So what do I mean by characteristics of life? This is an incomplete uh, set of characteristics of living systems, but it is important to have these, I think, to guide my research and what my research goals are. We can imagine that living things have a body that separates the self from the environment. And it has a metabolism, which is a process by which we can convert matter and energy into building blocks for ourselves, to sustain our, ourselves. And when you couple these together, you can then produce systems that are capable of movement and perhaps replication, and I'll talk about both of those tonight. Um, if you couple these with inheritable information, which could be DNA, it doesn't have to be DNA, it just has to be information that you can then pass on to your, to your offspring. You could then get something perhaps more sophisticated that could give you intelligent systems and evolving systems. And this would be the framework that I will be speaking about here tonight. Okay. So what do we want to do? What do we want to do to, what, with this kind of stuff? This is basically what we want to understand. How the properties of life, whatever they are, manifest themselves in simple chemical and physical systems. So this is very much a physical and chemical approach to understanding living systems. Even though I'm a biologist, I'm working in a physics lab now, and coming from this perspective. Um, we want to understand how simple systems, if we make these simple systems, how they, uh, when you specify every component that's in there, how do these evolve, if they can evolve. And also the fundamental properties of matter in relation to more higher order processes that we think that are uh, higher order anyway. Intelligence and cognition is quite interesting to us. And then how, if at all, any of this relates to understanding where life came from, this origin of life perspective. So that's where we're at for the for introduction. Um, I will now move on to the first protocell model that I did when I was a postdoc, and it's basically working with membranes, vesicle membranes. And what we were trying to do, basically I'll talk about both of these subtopics, replication cycle and clays. Um, what we are trying to do is make a protocell, one of these simple chemical cells, replicate without putting any biochemistry inside the system. Now we know that modern cells have a lot of things that cause a cell to say go from one single cell to split into two, right, with a cytoskeleton and all these things. It's very interesting cyto. Uh, plasmic machinery, physical machinery, that allows these cells to, to break apart. And so, we want to do that without that complexity, make it simpler. So, we, these primitive cells then will rely upon self-organization of the components and on interactions with the environment to achieve these basic cellular functions such as growth and division, and that's what we're going to show here. Growth of these uh, protocells and division of the protocells. So that's our goal. And the way we can do that conceptually is here, in this cycle. Imagine we make one of these artificial membranes out of lipids here. Okay, it's just the water outside, water inside, with a membrane here, and we want to grow it. And the way we're going to grow it is basically adding membrane components to the system, so feeding it more of itself, which hopefully can get incorporated into this one here, and then grow to a larger size. And we want to monitor that precisely. 
Once we have a larger size, we want to then divide these back down to the original size and then do an iterative cycle like this. So basically multiple rounds of growth and division, again driven basically from outside of the system. The, the bag itself, the bag of water doesn't do anything, it's not expected to do anything except sit there and be manipulated by the experimenter. And just for clarity, uh, basically what we're talking about here are these bilayer membranes with some fatty acids, which are amphiphiles that constitute these membranes here. Water outside, water inside, and you make these population of vesicles of various size distribution. And you know you've made these because basically the components here that make up the vesicles are very small supermolecular structures called micelles. And this is a much larger uh, supermolecular structure with say hundreds of thousands of these individual fatty acids that make this up. And because you go from these building blocks here that are very small to this larger one, that, when I say larger, this is, you still need a microscope to see it, to see the individual structures. But they're large enough that they scatter light. So if I take a solution here with the, with the feeding material uh, at the same concentration as in this tube here where the vesicles are, you can immediately see, immediately see the visual difference. These vesicles are formed here and they start scattering light and it just looks very milky. And this is another reason why milk is, it has this kind of cloudiness to it. Because you have structures in there, small, they're small structures, but they're scattering light. So that's base, the basic system that we're speaking about here with these artificial membranes. And we can make a lot of these, they're very easy to make because they're formed by self-assembly. Just put them in the mix, just wait, and then they start forming. And so uh, the, what we want to do is make a whole population of these vesicles here, already made, feed them some of the micelles that are the components of the membrane, and hopefully these will get incorporated into here to make grown vesicles on the other side. And the way we do this experimentally is shown here. This is the, my lab bench. Um, basically, we have a little test tube here with some cloudy little uh, vesicles inside that I put in there. And I'm going to grow these very slowly by injecting the components, the food components, from these syringes here. It's very slow injection here, and a stir bar here to stir everything up. And this is uh, under argon, so no oxygen comes and interferes with our, with our system. And this is how, basically, <laughs> one of our protocell growth chambers, if you want to call it that, looks like. It's very primitive, as you can see, but it's the proof of principle that counts in this case. And so, we can monitor the diameter of these vesicles over time. And uh, this is just diameter here, time here. Over the course of a few hours, we see then the diameter is slowly creeping up uh, with these vesicle systems. So we know uh, by this test, which is dynamic light scattering, and other sort of more precise tests, that we can grow vesicles in a controlled way if we add in the food very slowly over time. That seems to work just, just, just fine. And one of the outcomes of this, which is interesting for those of you studying biochemistry and biology, is that we can actually generate gradients with this. And gradients, of course, are very important in biology, for example, energy production. You need gradients, and that's the other reason you need membranes in biology, to, to create separation, to make a gradient, then to drive some sort of chemical reactions. We get some pH gradients for free in this system because we have a preformed vesicle here, bilayer structure, we're adding in the food source over here, which gets incorporated here. So you have an excess of food source in the outer membrane here, but you have an inner membrane as well, which doesn't have enough stuff in it. So in order to equilibrate, these need to flip from the outside to the inside. And when they flip, they basically bring with them a proton every time, because it's easier to, to flip one of these if it's protonated. So every time it flips, you basically get a, a proton that's coming inside. You generate, therefore, an automatic pH gradient in these systems. So that's quite nice how you can link these very simple processes of growing a, a, a membrane to actually growing, if, in a sense, a pH gradient that could be used to drive reactions. So that's, that, that's part of the story. So we, we played a lot with this growth to get it right. Um, now the process, when I left it basically, it was about 90% effective. So the stuff that you put in gets incorporated 90% of the time, which we thought was good enough. Um, then we turned our, our sites to this division process, and again, we're going to divide it externally, right? The, 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 the sort of lipid uh, uh, membrane uh, vesicle doesn't really do anything except go along for the ride. We're going to put some shear stress on this and break it down to a smaller size, and the easiest way to do that is by using extrusion. So these are small uh, microscopic pores in a polycarbonate membrane. You, you have the membrane in here, and you have a, 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 a syringe here, and you just push your vesicles of a certain size, probably big size, 
through a small pore and they break up to smaller ones on the other side. So it's a very simple physical mechanism. You can just push these things through and uh, it works really well with a very minimal loss of contents, by the way. So if you want to put something interesting inside, some interesting molecules, you can preserve those inside. So then we just <clears throat> did a proof of principle, put our vesicles in a tube, add in the food over time so the vesicles grow to a certain size, take a portion of the population, extrude it through one of these filters to divide it to this uh, smaller size, and then repeat the whole process over and over again, and then monitor the, uh, the dimensions of the, of the vesicles over time. So here's the diameter again, and this is the step and cycle number, okay? This is the size distribution. When you have, uh, when we start off the experiment, we have vesicles that are about 80 nanometers in diameter, so very, very small, right? And then we grow them, and then we divide them, grow them, and divide them, and we just keep going with this. And so we're able to demonstrate just by these simple physical chemical principles that you can drive a replication cycle in these uh, very primitive systems, which is very, crucial if you're thinking about you want uh, think about evolution in these systems you need replication so that's kind of the the, the, the story there um, after I left that group um, another person took up my system and actually made a visualization which I think is important to understand what's going on here so up here in this micrograph it's a, a, a fluorescence micrograph you see little points of light these are vesicles Okay, these vesicles have fluorescent dye inside of them, which is why you can see the points of light. So it's basically this with some fluorescent dye inside. And they added in the micelles, the, the food, like the same way I did. And what they can see happening here is they, these round dots that get extended into these worm-like structures here. And you can see it again here, this round one gets some worm-like structures here. And then they just do division by blowing on the sample. Just a little physical agitation because they're very unstable, these worms. And you just blow at them and they collapse and form these, uh, these smaller droplets here. So you can then do a growth and division cycle. And this is a, this is a good illustration of how you can do that with these uh, very primitive things. Um, there was a side note with this research that I think is related to the uh, origin of life. And I'll go through that just quite briefly here. Because um, we, we found something quite unexpected and interesting happening. Basically, <laughs> I was talking about basically body here and not really metabolism, but basically adding food to the system that is incorporating, incorporated into the body to form this replication cycle here. No inheritable information in sight as far as we know. So we decided to add some, something could be considered inheritable information, basically strands of RNA to the system and some clay. So this is naturally occurring clay that you would find, and uh, it's called montmorillonite. And we added in small pieces of RNA labeled with a, with a red fluorescence marker so we can see where they go and basically do some microscopy. And we see some clay particles here in the microscope. And the RNA, which is red, is stuck all over these things. So the RNA loves to associate with clay particles. That's, that's good. So we have something that can be considered information on the clay. And the surprising thing then came when we decided to add some of the food stuff, uh, these, uh, these lipid molecules, the food stuff to the system, which are basically labeled with the green fluorescent marker so we can see where they go. And what we found was that this clay, these clay particles help to organize a membrane around themselves. So what we're left with are a lot of these membrane structures. Here you can see membranes within membranes, small, big ones, all kinds of ones, thick ones down here. But what we have is a huge complex vesicle here. And inside it has clay particles with RNA stuck to them, which has organized its own encapsulation inside of a, of a membrane. So that was quite interesting that all you have to do basically is mix these components together, self-assembly takes over and starts to make structures that resemble at least very, very crudely uh, the architecture of a, of a living cell. That's the point with this. And the reason that this clay is very exciting, I mean it's a natural occurring clay, um, is that it was found uh, by Ferris, uh, quite a while ago now, 96, that these clay structures are actually, uh, at atomic resolution, they're very regular, nice ordered clay structures that then absorb molecules on them, organic molecules, such as the monomers that make up RNA. So it can absorb some monomers of RNA on the surface here and catalyze the formation of RNA polymers, short ones, but still it can do the chemistry that's required to turn monomers into polymers. And so this is exactly the clay that's now organizing membranes around itself. So we think that's quite interesting from an origin of life perspective that you can kind of get 
some of the basics of living systems, self-organizing, same place, same time. That's the idea. So RNA is a drop on play, right? Yeah. Uh, so what about polymerization? I didn't understand that part. So the RNA, uh, in our case, we already had short oligos of RNA that were not polymerized. It's just RNA, just a 15-mer. Labeled with a uh, fluorescent dye at the end, and then just looking where it goes. And then, um, so that's part of the story. That's what you're seeing here. Okay? The chemistry is run by this other guy here, which basically says you put the monomers, um, the clay is a, a SMEC type, which means it's layered clay structures. And when you add water to it, they expand and they let molecules inside. And in this very sort of um, constrained environment, you have catalysis happening from monomers to polymers. It's very slow. And, you know, it takes a long time, but you can get that to work. So that's the catalytic site that people point to when they say, well, how can you, how can you even get something complex as RNA to polymerize? So people like this clay story for quite a while now. So the, the conclusions from this part, um, the organization synthesis of these RNA polymers and the organization of compartments can occur on this same surface. I said that already, and uh, we can get these sort of primitive cell-like compartments from doing these kinds of studies. So, the growth and division. We can do some growth and division of primitive cellular membranes in the absence of any biomolecular machinery through the inputs from outside of the system now. Inputs of material, inputs of energy that are relevant, of course, to the origin of life. I didn't mention that these membrane components that we're talking about are very simple membrane components. They're, they're related to the membranes we have in our body, but they're much, much simpler in complexity. And so they have some relevance to the origin of life. And so that's kind of where this is going here, trying to couple some of the body with metabolism, leading to some sort of replication cycle, and maybe eventually to evolution here. So that's the first part of the, of the talk uh, with, with membranes. But uh, more recently, I was asking myself, what else could protocells do? Because frankly, when you make one of these protocells that has clay inside, it has some RNA sticking to it, and it's enclosed in a membrane, it just, it just sits there and looks at you, right? You're looking at it, and the microscope is just looking at you, and the only way it's going to do something is if you feed it with something, right? And, um, uh, and who knows? So, um, so we started thinking about more dynamic systems that we can play with that would be much more fun. Um, so the rationale here is that a simple or complex metabolic network, whether it's chemical or biochemical, doesn't matter, if you encapsulate that or localize that in a protocell, it will go towards equilibrium, right? Everything goes towards equilibrium. In a chemical sense, that means it's dead. So in a protocell can be actually kept going or alive in a chemical sense in an open system where you feed the system and you take out the waste. You just keep doing that, and that's fine. But what about a more independent protocell that would need to seek out its own food resources? So it has to navigate its own environment and find food in order to sustain itself. Can we do, can we find a protocell like this that avoids its own, by itself, by its own mechanism, avoids equilibrium? So that leads me to the second part, second protocell model, dealing with droplets here. And um, I will start this part by giving you an exam. That's a good idea, right? You're students mostly, right? So you should be used to this. So instead of thinking about what is life, why don't we consider which which is life? And I will give you two examples. They're both microscopic movies that are taking of systems. One system is a natural living organism, uh, or a bunch of them. And the second one is a chemical experiment that we do in the laboratory that is not, that's not alive. And I will play both for you so you can have a look at what you think here. So first, example one, microscopic image. again so you can see it again. Remember you're going to be tested on this, so you have to pay attention. <laughs> okay, so we'll run the second one now. So watch what happens on the right there when these other guys come over. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. So, you like these? The movies are fun. It's a good one to represent this. So let's let's go to the, to the exam now. So who thinks example one is a living system? Okay, good, good living system for number one. Okay, who thinks living, uh, system two is a living system? Yeah, I think system two beats system one, but not by much. So it's a bit 50-50, and you have a 50-50 chance because you know it's not a trick test. One of the, one of them is a real living system. Before we get to the answer, I'll give you the background behind the experiment that you're seeing here. Um, I think this was, in, in my study of the history of this field, this is the first protocell that was ever made. This is by a German guy named Bushley here. You can see him there. He's wearing his lab coat, which is great. This looks really serious. Nice beard. And uh, he's a German zoologist. And he was fascinated by the amoeba. So fascinating that he wrote a book that is like that thick on the movies. Yeah, he was really obsessed. But what he wanted to do was actually make... He was very fascinated by the way the amoeba moves, right? It sends out this pseudopod, right? It kind of has a little feeler and then it kind of moves around and finds which way to go. So it distorts its own body while it's moving along. And he was so fascinated by this that he wanted to make a laboratory model of the amoeba so he can study how it moves. So he made something that moves in the laboratory that resembled the amoeba. And, um, and I won't show you this because I will show you something later. But basically, he was observing, when we, when we went back and did these experiments, microscopically we can see these kinds of structures here forming. Just what it, all it is is a sodium hydroxide in olive oil. That's a simple chemical system here. Does anyone know what sodium hydroxide does when it comes into contact with olive oil? It, uh, it breaks bonds. Anyone? So this is a very classic reaction called a saponification reaction. That means that you're making soap. This is how you make soap. You start with fat or oil, which is a triglyceride. You add a lot of base to it, you break the bonds, and you precipitate out the stuff that's there. Basically, that's this. This is the precipitate here. So you're basically making soap. So that's how he came, that's how he found this chemistry, I guess, just from soap makers. And he was able to make these very dynamic structures here that appear to like blob around, move around, and also interact with each other, and leave some sort of chemical trails as well in these systems. So I think this was the first protocell, and that's what you're seeing in these, these things here. Um, basically, when you, when you, whoever voted for uh, example one, you're wrong, I'm sorry. But you picked a really interesting system. I'm oh, sorry, this is the living system. Sorry, you're right. Uh, this is dictostelium. This is slime mold. So this is, a, uh, this is going from a single stage organism, it's a population of organisms here, sending out secondary messengers that diffuse through the population, and they basically then condense to form multicellular organisms. And that's how this looks. It's, it's amazing how this organism can do it. So this is a real living organism. And this is the Bushley system. This is the stuff that he was looking at. He didn't have a good microscopic uh, uh, representation of that system like we have here. Um, but anyway, this kind of communal behavior that you saw, if I do this again, I think it's, it's fascinating. When these, uh, when these come in and invade the population here, they just scatter. This is, this is behavior, in my opinion. This is not a living system. This is, this is you know, water and oil, right? It's, not, it's, it's a simple chemical reaction, a soap reaction, but you're getting stuff that is basically acting communally and seems to be uh, having higher order kind of behavior going on. So this is what really fascinated us about uh, these kinds of oil systems, what you can actually understand about living systems based on oil droplets or water droplets in that case. Um, and so we started working on this making protocells out of basically oil droplets in this case. So we're working with oil droplets. And when you work with oil droplets and you put these in water, they don't mix, right? They will just sit there and nothing will happen unless you do something to the system or something is done in the system that destabilizes the whole thing and then you get some dynamic processes such as movement and we will talk about that uh, here today. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. You put oil and water, they don't mix, so you have self-assembly of these kind of oil droplets. And what you're looking at in this movie is two water pockets 
Here, two different oil droplets in each water pocket, and the color is, is uh, not important. There's no chemistry there. And I'm going to add a chemical activator to this, because this is just sitting there. This is a quasi-equilibrium system. Nothing is happening. Here comes the chemical activator added to the system. The system now becomes dynamic, and it responds to this chemical impetus by moving towards each other and then fusing into one dropper, which now is the stable state of the system. And this is the, the, the control here. So this is basically what I'm talking about. Oil and water don't mix, and they're not going to do anything interesting unless you put something else, add something else into the system. That leads us to how we're going to then create mobile droplets from these droplets that don't do anything. And what we did was take the same oil droplets that you saw in the previous video, and instead of adding the chemistry from outside, right, we add the chemistry inside the oil itself. So we put some, some oil in there. This is a precursor, it's called an oleic anhydride. It's an oil phase, it easily mixes with the, with the oil droplet. And in water, at high pH, it hydrolyzes to form these surfactants here, basically oleate and two protons. That's the simple, simple one-step chemical reaction that we put in the oil phase. So it has its own fuel on board, let's say. And the reason that this is important is we consider that biological systems, the behavior of biological systems has a lot to do with their own internal mechanisms, right? Bio living things aren't doing things because someone's always pushing them around, right? We want some kind of autonomy in these kind of protocell models. So we give it its own fuel source that it can do something with. And when we do that, we have a droplet that would normally just sit there for the entirety of the, of the experiment, and now we have a dynamic one. And we can observe that even macroscopically. We make these, these the, the previous vesicle ones are only microscopic. Now we can make microscopic and macroscopic uh, protocells that you can see with your eye. So this is a pool of water here with a pH indicator, uh, which is blue at, at high pH. It becomes colorless around pH 11 and below, and these are the different chemical uh, components here of the system. And when we add the protocell here, which is coming, it's a red one, it breaks symmetry. This is faster than real time, okay? Um, eight times real time. It breaks symmetry and it starts to move from one side of this container to the other, right? Of its own, this is its own mechanism, how, to, how it's moving here. And it's leaving a chemical trail, as you can see, behind it as it moves. So it's modifying its environment as it goes. And this, depending on how you set up the experiment, can last from minutes to hours. Okay? And there are different kinds of motion that we observe when we start playing with the system a bit. But this is the basic kind of motion that we're speaking about. Self-moving droplets leaving a chemical trail. And we can, mod we can monitor the chemical trail with all kinds of different chemicals to see what's going on. And we can see that a once homogeneous environment has all these very interesting chemical waves that are then placed into the environment. And one of the most interesting chemicals that's placed into this environment is the, are the protons, the pH change that's happening around that droplet. And when we measured that, the pH locally around a droplet that's moving, it has pH 12 on one side and below pH 7 on the other side. So it's a huge, huge pH gradient that's generated around this droplet. And we thought, okay, so this is, this is a huge potential driving force for this whole thing. So what happens if we play with one of these droplets and we add in a pH gradient from outside the system? Will it even notice? So here comes our protocell again, moving around 10 times real time. And then I'm going to add a pH gradient here. Very high pH in this zone, we can see with the blue indicator. The droplet boosts till it encounters this pH gradient and it appears to pause. And then it climbs to the highest point of that pH gradient. So it basically can find this chemical in the environment and, and follow the gradient. It could actually move itself. So I call this chemotaxis. And this is not, this is not biological chemotaxis. You know, biology, we know about this mechanism works now. Biology doesn't use this mechanism for chemotaxis. But the result is the same, that you have this sort of motion towards something, towards something in a chemical gradient, and that's exactly what is happening with this very primitive droplet. And if you count the number of, of, of chemicals that are necessary to produce a drop, to produce a protocell, capable of chemotaxis, just like living systems have, you only have five components that you need to add, including the water that's in the dish, okay? So you can make something that's chemotactic out of very simple starting uh, chemicals and, and show this kind of behavior. So we thought this was really, really interesting. For those of you interested 
in the kind of technical aspects, I have a couple of slides. Why is this sensitive to pH? It's because you have a pH sensor in the system. This metabolism produces oleate, as I said, and oleate has two forms. Oleate could be deprotonated here with a negative head group, and this is the chain, uh, acyl chain, or it could be protonated with this head group here, and here's the same acyl chain, and it goes back and forth depending on the pH of the environment. What all this means is, when it's deprotonated, it's negative and it's a very good soap. It's something you could use to wash your hands. And when it's protonated, it's a very, very bad soap and it's actually, a water, it's actually an oil itself. So it's really bad as, as a soap. And so it's going back and forth between these based on pH. And we start the experiment here and we see that the trailing edge, as this droplet is moving, it's making a very low pH trail, which means you have this state here. Okay, so basically the interfacial tension for those of you studying forces and things in the system, is, is really, really different from one side of that droplet to the other side. The forces that that droplet feels are really, really different because of that pH gradient that it generates itself, right? So it, it could follow my pH gradient, but when it's moving independently, it makes its own pH gradient and it's following its own. Just another note about the mechanism here, if you're interested in how this thing moves, um, you basically could, uh, it, it's kind of shown here in this, uh, this image, when it comes into focus, this droplet is slowly moving up this way uh, across the micrograph, and it has a convective cell. What's happening is the oil phase itself is convecting, it's moving, right? The whole internal part of that droplet is moving, and that's how this thing basically moves. And it's, uh, for those physicists in the audience, this is a Marangoni-induced instability in a, in, in a spherical liquid-liquid system. This is well... Uh, documented, and um, that's how we can get things moving in the system. So I'd, I'd explain this kind of droplet system a bit, how this, how this works and how we can get things moving. And I think the most important one, I'll, I'll just go to the next slide here, um, is, is this last one. Um, I don't know, if, is it advanced over here? Or do we need to advance it? Yeah, just go to the next slide over here on this. Oh, thanks. Perfect. Um, the coupling of this simple one-step hydrolysis reaction, right? It's a very simple chemical reaction. It's nothing sophisticated like biochemistry is sophisticated. Um, in this spherical oil droplet, sustains now a mobile and non-equilibrium state over time, which I think is the most fascinating part of this. It's a completely artificial system, right? There are no living organisms that are made of oil. Right? So, this is a very much an abstract system. But what it's doing is it's using its own internal mechanism to avoid equilibrium, which, and it's doing that by moving, and this is exactly what we are doing. Right? We are moving, and we're going, and we're eating things because we're continuously trying to avoid chemical equilibrium. This is what life does. And so this little uh, simple chemical system has found a way also to do exactly the same thing, avoiding equilibrium by finding food in its environment, basically. So I want to move, once you get things, once you get things moving, uh, things become very interesting, I think, from a certain perspective, it's certainly from an observational perspective. Once you start getting chemical experiments that move, very strange things start happening. And so I will move now to this idea of collective behavior. What happens when you're looking at more than one droplet? And it's interesting from a perspective, uh, from a lot of different perspectives, you might consider uh, what's happening collectively in human populations, but we can certainly say something about insect populations, which probably are more, less sophisticated than us in some ways, that this is a termite mound here. Very small insects are basically leaving chemical trails behind them to tell other insects, don't build here, right? Just by doing very simple, just having very simple chemical communication between these insects, they can produce elaborate and sophisticated architectures like this termite mound here. You know, you break this and they will, they will rebuild it, right? So they, they know what they're doing. They're very good at this kind of thing. And it's, we think it's based on very simple principles. You have, you have uh, insects that are moving, carrying cargo, and leaving simple chemicals to say, do not build here. And then you can get weird things happening like this. We think that we can get the same kinds, the same flavor of behavior from our simple chemical protocells because they're moving and they're sensitive to the environment, right? As we've seen. So I'll just show some movies here to exemplify this, uh, this kind of collective behavior. We're gonna put more than one protocell in, a, in an experiment. So here's a dish again, 
It's a macroscopic experiment, so it's something you can see with your eye. Uh, this is an inactive droplet. It has no fuel in it. Okay? And we're going to add in a, an active droplet, a blue one, that has the uh, anhydride fuel so it can move. And then we can observe behavior. So something strange is happening already, right? It's very strange. They like each other. They do. They do. I think red and blue, by definition, likes each other, right? I think that's what people say. Um, so you start to see kind of a very sort of physical interaction between these droplets. We can do the same experiment with two active droplets that are moving. So here we go here. The color is irrelevant. It's just dye, just for purpose of distinguishing. So what kind of intermolecular interactions happening then? Sorry? What kind of intermolecular interactions happening there? I will try to explain that. Good question. So what we see here in this example when they're both moving, they appear to have this kind of following behavior. One follows the other and then the other one follows, right? And it's a bit of a dance basically what's happening here. And they don't like to touch each other unlike these over here, right? These don't like to touch each other, but you see this very often in these experiments that you have some sort of coordinated behavior between moving droplets. So what we can do with these kinds of studies is track the position of these droplets over time and plot those out. Uh, just do some traces here and, for example, plot what is the mutual distance between two droplets over time when they become close to each other and far away, close to each other and far away, and then look at what's the distribution if you do this many times and basically uh, when you have two droplets, active droplets in the same experiment, they like to be very close to each other, each to each, very close to each other. This is mutual distance here, and this is a frequency histogram. So this means they're very close to each other, not touching each other, okay, but very close. And if you do a control experiment with single droplets in two different dishes, but you overlay the plots as if they were in the same experiment, of course, they don't, they don't do anything. They basically don't have any idea that the other one is there because it's not there. So that's the difference between the distributions here. So we can really now quantitatively see something is going on. These droplets are communicating with each other in some way. And we don't have all the answers, the mechanistic detail of the answers, but we have some, some answers and some clue. Because one of the interesting things of working with these protocell models is that we can scale them. So if you wanted to, for example, want to study your E. coli, at 10 times its size, good luck, because you're not going to be able to make an E. coli 10 times its size. But if you have an artificial protocell, you can basically make any size that you want and study what happens. So what we did here is exactly that. Just scale the size, or the volume in this case, from lower to higher volumes. Look at how they move, track how they move, and also know what is the dominant shape. Well, the smaller droplets tend to be spherical, or when they move in a straight line, they have this sort of horseshoe shape here, a boomerang shape. The larger droplets also move, but they move much differently, and they're also really easily distorted. All right? They do a lot of shape changes, they move kind of more like this amoeba type of, of motion. And what's interesting is if you plot these, how they move, the ones that can form, uh, the smaller ones, uh, have shown this collective behavior. They like to be close to each other. The larger ones, they don't care. They just they can completely ignore each other when they move. And one of the reasons is, and we don't know exactly how everything works, but we can certainly say that these guys are very good at setting up this convective cell that I showed you before, where the internal volume is moving. If you can, if you can make this fluid dynamic, then you can actually communicate with your neighbor. If you can't set up a stable convective flow, which is happening here, which is why this is distorting, because it's distorting under its own influence, its own uh, uh, fluid flow, you can't organize anything around yourself. So that would mean this is a fluid dynamic argument for why these, these, these guys are communicating with each other. And we can discuss other possibilities maybe afterwards, but that's, just, that's what I'd like to say about that. Okay, once you get things moving uh, and you can make all kinds of different recipes in these systems for fun. You could basically make two different types of protocells. Because what I showed you before, when they were interacting, these protocells were basically the same. I mean, they're red and, and blue, but that didn't mean anything. 
But you can make different chemical protocells and you can put them together. And so we have two, vesicle, two uh, protocell droplet populations here. And this one, when it's activated, likes to vibrate. And basically, this is the moving motile uh, protocell here. The second one, uh, when it's activated, it likes to come together and fuse into one big protocell. This, this is the simple system, the simple rules. And so we can play a game putting both of these in the same system. Here's one population, another population here, and add in the chemical activator. Now, okay, when things are active, the, the, the orange ones just vibrate, and the blue one comes, all the blue ones will assemble into one big protocell. And then we've reached equilibrium, game is over. And, you know, we could, we could do this many, many times, and then once in a while, something different happens. And in the next movie, what I will show is that the different thing that happens is very early on, one of the blue ones fused with one of the orange ones, which is a rare event, but it happens. So we start again. There's a blue population. Here comes the orange population, and then they're going to fuse. Aha. Orange and blue have now fused together to form a hybrid one, right? Add in a chemical activator, that hybrid acts as if it's dancing, like it's, a, it's an orange one here. But that was going to fuse with this big blue one here. And when that happens, it becomes very unstable. And it self-divides into two. Now you have two protocells, okay? And this is because you had this kind of chance event that happened between two different types of protocells, you basically now have increased the chemical complexity of this thing, and we know quite a lot now how this, how this works, which I can discuss afterwards, um, leading to a fluid dynamic that basically breaks this, best, this, this uh, protocell into two. Normally it wouldn't be broken into two. But basically the fluid dynamics are basically ripping it apart. So this is what I would call, if you think about people, if you think about living systems and what living systems are good at, or what's interesting about living systems is that there's this idea about emergence, where you have basically the coming together of different kinds of components to make something that is more of the sum of its parts. And this is, I think, a very simple chemical example of what I would mean, what I would consider emergence here, where you have this protocell that vibrates, the protocell that fuses, and if by chance they fuse together, you get this superfuser state which could vibrate and fuse with everything. And if that's true, you can get a replication here of these guys, which then could fuse with more of these, fuse and vibrate, and just have its own replication cycle, which would be further down the line in development of this system. Yes? Well, is this any related with the concentration of the molecules? Yeah, it's related, but that's not the main determinant. It's the, um, it's the combination of the molecules that are solvated in protocell A and protocell B that are normally separated. So the, one thing I should add, I guess, about this, um, and the reason, one of the reasons why this is so fascinating is because these are far from equilibrium systems. The reason that these are dancing and doing all these crazy things is because we're not at equilibrium. We're at a state where we have a chemical concentration here that's much higher than over here, right? And just by then, this sort of flow of stuff towards equilibrium, you get some very interesting behavior. So what I'm saying is protocell A has a high concentration of, of this molecule, protocell B of this molecule, and then all of a sudden they've come together, and this adds a little bit of complexity, but just enough that would then drive this reaction. And there's much more sort of um, fluid dynamic detail which we can discuss later, yeah. So, so there's a bit of origin of life context I'll just briefly mention here uh, with, with regard to this droplet protocell system, because I basically have tried to make the simplest, purest uh, protocell that is able to move and show this chemotaxis behavior, for example. But this has nothing to do with the origin of life because basically I'm buying this stuff from Sigma Aldrich in purest form I can get, right? I mean, that's what we do in our labs, right? Um, the early Earth, if you want to consider what kind of environment that could have been there, I mean, we had a, there was a whole mess of stuff. People talk about a primordial soup, for example, right, of molecules. And that has nothing to do with 99.9% .9 pure chemicals. It's just this is a complete uh, fabrication, and I think has very little or nothing to do with the origin of life. So what we did as a counter experiment, just just for fun, is leave out this this, this sort of uh, the pure fuel source here, and give it a very complex fuel source. And what I mean is, we took this uh, anhydride fuel source, knocked that out. We don't want that anymore. 
and we're putting in something else. The thing we're putting in is this hydrogen cyanide chemistry. And simply what this means is hydrogen cyanide is an abundant and highly energetic simple molecule that could react with itself several times to polymerize itself into such a large and complex polymer that it actually crashes out of a, of a, of a chemical experiment. It crashes out as a black junk, muck, kind of a mucky thing. And that is exemplified here. This is a pure uh, vial of oleic acid, and this is the junk that you produce in this reaction. So this is basically, if you've, you've taken an organic chemistry lab, this is what goes wrong, right, in your organic chemistry lab. You've made junk instead of your pure compound. That's what we wanted to make, right? So we made basically a primordial soup out of this hydrogen cyanide, and we switched that into the oil droplet as a source of fuel instead of having the pure stuff. And basically it can show some, show some interesting stuff. Here's the oil droplet. The black stuff that you see that's inside, black stuff that's at the interface, the black stuff that's outside is the polymer. So it's a mess even setting up the experiment. This black stuff just goes everywhere. And you start observing this under the microscope. And this is the first few seconds of one of these experiments. Um, you'll see the droplets here. I think it's this one first. This one starts to so some internal motion here. Okay, that one's going. Now it's convecting. This one's like there's fluid flow in this one, it's convecting. And then finally this one then starts to catch up and starts convecting and moving around in the system. Okay, so we can basically fuel movement of these oil droplets, not with pure chemicals, but with a completely complex mixture of junk. Um, how complex is it? We don't know. Uh, an estimate is 50,000 different types of molecules that are there in very, very minute quantities is what we're putting into this system. And it has to organize itself out of that soup, which I think is more, much more relevant to the origin of life. When you think about how life could have gotten started, self-assembly is a big, a big one, right? We need self-assembly to bring, in, bring molecules together in some way. Um, but there may be other mechanisms that we need to consider. Self-movement could be one of those. Um, and this is a good example of how you can actually organize self-movement from a very, very complex and uncontrolled starting point. And just, uh, just for fun, uh, you can get these convecting and moving uh, primordial blobs here to respond to a gradient. This is a pH gradient. And they very much like that and will we'll move into the grave. So they'll do chemotaxis as well, which is important for this, for this argument. So, um, I think the conclusion that's most interesting about this, um, which I'll just say briefly, is the fuel here is not explicitly defined, right? You imagine that to get something moving chemically, you would need pure components. That makes sense, because you can imagine there are a lot of things you can put into your, your chemical experiment that would actually stop the system. There are inhibitors probably everywhere. We don't purify anything. So there are fuel molecules in here, and there also are inhibitors in here. I mean, everything goes into the pot. And the point is it has to then find its own fuel source and exploit it on its own. And that's what it's able to do quite easily in these systems. Okay. <clears throat> so the simple oil drop that I've been talking about here has these lifelike properties, basically movement, environmental remodeling, chemotaxis, communal behavior. Even prebiotic tar-like substances can animate these oil droplets, as we've seen. So perhaps assembling protocells is not enough. I'm interested in understanding what other mechanisms can we come up with that are really essential for getting life started, um, and specifically to avoid chemical equilibrium. And so movement in this case in chemotaxis, I think, are really good, really good at doing that. And this brings us to this quote or this term by Steve Benner in the U.S. about weird life, and he was part of a, a committee in the U.S. National Research Council 2007 report. Their task was to try to understand how we could recognize life elsewhere in the universe, especially life that is not really life here on Earth. So we consider that all life on this Earth has a lot of very distinct commonalities. But what if there's some other way, and how could we recognize that? And so the very general principles that they, they've, they've concluded in this report are basically you need a system or an environment that has it's in thermodynamic disequilibrium. Again, we're trying to avoid equilibrium, right? So we need a system where there's energy and matter input and then waste output from the system. That's absolutely necessary. You also need components to have liquid form, right? Now, all of our life in biochemistry is water-based, right? So when we're looking for life elsewhere in the universe, 
we typically send up these probes to look for water. But water is not enough, you need liquid water. You need liquid form of water if you want to do chemistry. So liquid form of a solvent of any kind is necessary, not just water. Okay? And you need to be able to make and break covalent bonds. If you want to do chemistry, you need to bring those atoms together to make and break uh, and, and make molecules, basically. So that's also important. And that's basically the kind of principles that we're playing with in these kinds of chemical systems. And so, weird, this may be an example of weird life. That such primitive systems like I'm talking about here, and these mechanisms like self-movement, may have shaped the origin and evolution of life on Earth and elsewhere in the universe in my opinion, and that's what's really fascinating about this stuff. So just in the final moments, you're probably tired from a full day, then I'll just show you some pictures, and then we can get out of here, or, or, whatever, or whatever we're doing, I'm not sure. So, this topic is fascinating to some people, which I really appreciate, because I'm fascinated by it. And as you know, a lot of people come up to me and said they saw this TED Talk, which I'm happy that you did. It's a basically a much condensed version of what you've heard here tonight, without, without the details which is good uh, to, to show your friends. Um, but what you might not know is uh, this collaboration I had with some architects where we basically take this chemistry that I showed you tonight and take it out of the labora uh, laboratory and into the public. And we were very lucky to be chosen uh, to go to the Venice Architecture Biennale uh, two years ago, where we had one of the pavilions where we put our architecture exhibit together. And this architecture exhibit was called Hylozoic Ground, uh, this is the ancient belief that all matter has life. So there's not really this distinction between not living and not living system. If you have matter, you have life. Um, and this is what we were kind of playing with, with this exhibition, bringing these ideas to the general public. And um, this is just uh, the collaborators here uh, from Toronto and London. Uh, these are all architects and then there's me. I have no background in architecture at all. <laughs> so I don't understand a lot of that part. But what we wanted to do is set up a small room. This is a small room. You walk into this room and we wanted to set up a, a structure that would give you the feel that it was alive. This was the point. It doesn't look alive, but it had to sort of feel alive. And so what we did was to set up a whole room here with this canopy of plastic structures here that are all interconnected with wires and sensors and actuators. So basically, the proximity sensors. When you walk in next to the structure, it senses that you're there and it starts to move. Embedded in this structure are these flasks here that you might be able to see. And these are the chemical experiments that I talked about uh, in tonight's, uh, tonight's lecture. And this was all integrated together. And you can see that the, the really expansive canopy uh, here and the embedding of one of these uh, chemical experiments inside of one of these things. And the point is that it's made to look artificial. I mean, you have no doubt you're walking into something that was man-made. These are plastic parts, and these are wires, and these are lights blinking at you, right? But because you have this, this sort of um, sensor network structure that is responding to you, even at different time scales, you sort of feel like, well, maybe it knows I'm here, or maybe it's trying to communicate with me. And this is the point that we were trying to get across. What is it that makes something alive? If we can make something completely artificial, that you, can just, you, you go there and you touch it, you know it's artificial. But it's making you feel like there's some quality of living to it. This is exactly the impression that we wanted to, to impress upon the general public. Have no knowledge of artificial life or protocells. It, it doesn't matter. But the point is, can you capture something about life in these completely artificial uh, settings? So these are just more images here of this Venice Biennale here. Here's some, one of the droplets in the chemical experiments, more chemical experiments that were all embedded in this fascinating little thing. And it was very interactive. Right? Here's a little girl here playing, playing with it. Right? It's, you can go and touch it. It's not something that should be behind glass that you cannot approach. This is uh, very interactive. And this whole movement of architecture in this protocell and synthetic biology was written in an article by Rachel Armstrong here. This was published in Nature um, 2010. She also did a TED talk, which you can look at, Architecture That Repairs Itself. And she wrote a really nice, uh, really nice article in Nature about it, about our collaboration. Okay, let's conclude this. I talked about uh, two different types of protocells that are possible. Uh, basically, experimental models of, of a kind of primitive life. These uh, protocells are forms of self-assembly, and they are made dynamic when you start inputting material and energy into the system. 
But if these protocells contain simple mechanisms that make them autonomous, they're then capable of these interesting behaviors. I think motion chemotaxis collective behavior. And the other thing is these protocells are testable platforms for origin of life studies. A lot of people are interested in origin of life. We could have very interesting discussions about origin of life. Why not go into the laboratory and actually start testing this? I mean, there's a, there's a point of science that's observation, point that's hypothesis and, and philosophical, but there's also the point where you actually start testing your beliefs and your hypotheses, and you can do that with these systems, which I think is interesting. But it just doesn't end there, in my opinion. Uh, the outreach with the architecture is just one example of this, but basically, this kind of research can inspire new technologies. Basically, you're making stuff that no one has ever made before. For future applications, such as dynamic materials, I talk, talked about the architecture engineering perspective, but basically, for example, with these protocells, we have very simple sensors and actuators that you, could, that you can use. And there's a collaboration I have with some engineers who are interested in soft robotics. Uh, that you could actually make robots out of these things. So since this is an evolution conference, I want to end with this. Where is the evolution in this? Because I studied evolution. That's my primary interest. Um, I talked about these characteristics of life, how you can build up something that could lead to evolution. And I also talked about this continuum that might exist between non-living and living systems. And I think these kind of overlap quite well. On the non-living side, you're able to put in a bunch of these kinds of things here and see this kind of uh, phenomena. But on the life side, you basically lead to some more higher order uh, characteristics, intelligence, and especially evolution. And I think if you start playing with these kinds of simple chemical systems, you have to increase the chemical diversity so you have some side of kind of diversity, impose selection on the system, and replication on the system, and then you might be able to build something that is able then, at least in a very primitive way, and, uh, to evolve, and I think that will get us closer to understanding this part of the processes of living systems through these, through these entirely artificial systems. So, these are just some collaborators over the years uh, from various places, uh, Japan, US, um, uh, Denmark, and in the UK. And I would like to thank you for your attention tonight. I believe the format involves some questions, right? We can do that. Um, there's also an opportunity. I can show you one of these chemical experiments. I can put it on over there if you want to see that. Does anybody have interest in that? Yeah. Great. Let's see if this works. Hey, great. Great. So, I, are you my assistant? Great. My beautiful, my beautiful assistant. <laughs> Would you mind adding some olive oil to the dish on the, on the overhead, please? <laughs> so, what we're doing now is basically this, basically creating, recreating this first protocell experiment because it's the one that's least hazardous. Right? A lot of the moving protocells I showed you are best done in a, in a chemistry laboratory. This is this soap reaction that I mentioned early on. And basically what we've done here is just fill this up with some uh, really nice uh, Turkish olive oil. Right? <laughs> we just bought that from the store. We just bought it from the store. And we just put it in a dish. Uh, and then we got to get things started. So let's see. Yeah, I have some of this. Um, High pH water. Well, first, let's do drinking water. Let's, here's just just for a control where you can see what happens when, of course, when you add water to oil, nothing much happens. Oop. Okay, we got some blobs. We don't want to mix those. Okay, and we'll add some some. Blue stuff. I don't know if you can see blue on here or not. So this is a slow reaction, of course, making so. Uh, oh, you can see what's happening here. Good. So basically, the water droplets down there are kind of spherical, semi-spherical blobs that are not going to do anything because there's no reaction. You just have droplets in uh, water droplets in oil. But now look what happened with the other ones. They're forming these beautiful shapes as they're transforming in time, right? 
So basically, this is this, uh, the chemicals that were made by Bushley. I put a, a blue, bit of blue dye in there just so you can see the color difference, right? But basically, while we're talking here, these are going to be transforming in shape. They're going to be breaking apart into smaller and smaller pieces. And when I showed you that questionnaire, which is life, and I said that one is the chemical experiment where you have these little blobs that come together and then shoot apart, that's this experiment microscopically. So there's a lot happening here. You can see what's happening macroscopically with your eye, but if you use a microscope, there's a lot more interesting things that are happening on a very sort of uh, micro scale with these, uh, with these systems. Yeah, they're still moving. They're just slowly creeping around here. And this is, you know, what fascinated this, this researcher in the 1800s. He, he could make an artificial amoeba. Right. It turns out, uh, just so we know, just, it turns out that uh, the mechanism by which these blobs are moving and the amoeba moves are actually different. Right? The amoeba has this sort of cytoskeleton, actin, filaments, and all this stuff, and this doesn't have that. Um, this is driven by surface tension. But anyway, this, is the, this was the rationale for doing this. So, what's next? That's it. Questions? We can have questions, yeah? Please. So the other question is, what about increasing the complexity of these systems, for example, using combinatorial uh, strategies so that you really get a large explosion in diversity to look at how these things um, work. I believe that's a really good way to do it. Um, of course, the problem then becomes that we cannot actually physically make all the experiments that could lead, I mean, there's just too many experiments to do, so we have to think of a smarter strategy for doing it. And yes. It, and one, one is you could, um, if, if we're advanced enough, we basically throw in the molecular complexity that would be combinatorial complexity and then impose selection on the system. So we don't really have to necessarily control everything, um, which would then give us a big pool, big library to start with, and then try to narrow down which are the interesting compounds which would give you interesting behavior, which basically fulfills a fitness function of some kind, right? So. Yeah, that's, that's a really good strategy. Like I said, up until now, we try to keep things simple so we can kind of understand the physics and the chemistry of the system. Um, but just that experiment with the primordial ooze gets, starts to get at this point that you're talking about. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Thank you. There's a... There's a debate going on between the RNA world and the metabolism world yeah. uh, on the origins of life. Uh, do you think your work supports the metabolism first theories about the origins of life? Yeah. Um, you know, personally, I don't really have a side in this. But my interpretation of these results is that it's the metabolism first argument. But like I said, personally, I don't really. I don't really have a side of the camp that I stick to. I like this kind of experiment for its own reasons and not because of this context. Um, in my view, you know, uh, the RNA world is, is, is very much, it's much more complicated than the stuff I'm looking at here. So that means metabolic structures, metabolic networks are much easier for me to grasp from simple starting principles, let's say. Uh, however, um, I would encourage you to check out um, uh, John Sutherland, is uh, a chemist in the, in the UK. He will come out with a paper, I think, next week in Nature that shows a very interesting way of bringing iron sulfur chemistry and the RNA world together to do synthesis. So it'll come out next week, I think. Uh, John Sutherland is his name. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's up to her with the microphone. She will take care of it. Dear Professor, first of all, thanks for coming to our country. Thanks for this fantastic presentation. It's my first time here. Great. <laughs> Welcome then. Thank you. Um, 
Last week, I, I, I'm an engineer and last week I was abroad in Portugal with some Danish guys there. We had a meeting mm -hmm. and what I observed about Danish guys was they were so funny, they had a great sense of humor and I, had, I made friends with these two guys. And as far as I see during your presentation, you had a great sense of humor too. <laughs> Thanks. Unfortunately, we are lack of this in our country about sense of humor and science. Uh, and uh, as my, in my opinion, they are very close to explain to community having sense of humor and having science is very close because uh, explain all these things to to to, to non-expert people in, in a in a way of sense of in a way of humor in a way of comedies will be nice. Great. And coming to my question, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, fortunately, thanks. You mean <laughs> the. Uh, Carl Sagan, a great scientist in, from the US, was interested in some, somehow astronomy and biology. I mean, is, is the, the probability of another starting of life in, in another location in the universe. Yeah. And considering your studies, I mean, the, 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 the beginning of life uh, from, from non living thing to a living thing, um, what is your idea about, about the probability? of a, a, a similar starting of life in another location in the universe. Yeah, it's, um, it's not easy. The stuff, one thing I can say about these kinds of experiments is that there are conditions that are quite general that could lead to structures that we see here through self-assembly and the sort of dynamic properties that we can see, for example, through self-movement that could be easily accessible from many different starting conditions, in my opinion. Which means that you can start to organize structures that have living properties in many different environmental contexts. Of course, you know, the early Earth has a much different environmental context than now, but it had one, a certain one. Um, and different planets and, and, and comets, for example, have their own, their own kind of environments, which I think could be conducive to forming these, some of these kinds of structures and, and dynamics. The problem then becomes, does this have any relevance to the origin of life? I mean, I'm showing you basically some interesting tricks, right? I mean, these are fun things to study, and I'm learning a lot from them. They're not alive, uh, and I don't know if they ever will, for example, be able to show a kind of evolution that living systems show. So, in a sense, um, the, the, that perspective, I don't really know um, that even if these simple mechanisms are easily accessible and could happen in many different contexts, whether this would actually lead to, lead to sort of multicellular life or whatever you want. Something that, something that could really transform the whole ecosystem, like the, the whole environment. Like, you know, the, the oxygen that we breathe is a pollutant by, you know, organisms that has existed billions of years ago, right? They made oxygen for us to breathe, so we're, we're living on pollution. Right? This is a huge transformative environmental thing that happened. Whether these kinds of simple systems uh, would lead to that, I don't know, because uh, frankly, they're really too simple, in, in, in my view, to, to, have, to say too much about how relevant they are. One big problem, for example, is uh, they, we have no life forms that are oil droplets. You can do chemistry in oil droplets, you can do these things that I told you about. You know, you could have, you can solve a DNA single-stranded DNA inside of an, an anhydrous phase, it's, it's modified DNA, and it, bond, it binds together to form a helix. It's actually better doing it in organic phase than in water because, guess what? It's hard to form hydrogen bonds when you have lots of hydrogen in the water around. The water is a competitor for this. If you take away the water, you can get really good duplex formation of DNA. So there are lots of good arguments to suggest that all the chemistry that you need is, could be available in oil, right? But there's no, there's no oil organism that exists on this planet. It's, a, it's just a, it's something we're thinking of, right? We're just making it up. Uh, but we can consider if it's, it's, it seems to me a lot easier to make these kinds of oil droplet structures than to make even the vesicle structures that I talked about at the beginning of the talk, and certainly much easier than making a cell, even a, what we consider a primitive cell that by today's standards. It's just, it's just a lot easier in that sense. Did you ask about inheritance? So we are alone. So we are alone in the universe. <laughs> we are alone? I don't know. Uh, that's, you know, this astrobiology stuff is, 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 is fascinating and I don't know if we'll ever really be able to detect, be able to detect um, 
life on other planets because we don't know what we're looking for. We're looking for water, I think that's fine, but I think we need to consider other options and we don't know, therefore, what options to look for. So I don't know if we're looking in the right way or in the right place. Um, since we're a bunch of students here and I can philosophize, uh, I was at an astrobiology workshop actually uh, six months ago and we, the students were really concerned about uh, how you can detect life elsewhere in the universe and then I started asking them if they consider that uh, the World Wide Web is alive or if language is alive and they thought I was crazy and it, these are probably crazy questions but we can't really definitively rule, definitively rule out these things. We, I don't think we really know what life is on this planet and if we don't really know what life is on this planet how are we going to find life on other planets? That's only my personal perspective but you can quote me on that. <laughs> Um, can, oh, I, yes. can I, can I, I uh, go on with my question and the humor point made? Um, well, there is a humor for you. Uh, even if as scientists we produce a living cell and producing itself, um, there will be, from the scratch, there will be a lot of people in the world still denying evolution. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's a moving, first, there are a lot of considerations with that point that you just made. It's a moving target, right? Um, if I can produce something that has all of those characteristics of living systems, including evolution, right, in a sense, um, it's still going to be man-made, it's still not going to look right, and there will still be people who will say, well, that's not living. And that's perfectly fine, because people have different opinions, and that's fine. Um, it, it's just, from a scientific point of view, if I have a hypothesis and that I want to test, I will just test that hypothesis, and then I will move forward with my research. So that's, that satisfies me to produce an artificial system that is evolving, even if it's not biological evolution. So, so, so there's, there will be people who then agree with me and people who disagree. And that's the way life is. I mean, what, what, what do you, you, don't, you don't want, if you convince everyone, then life boring, I think. Yeah, right, <laughs> it becomes humorous. Yeah. <laughs> so? Yes, now. Yeah. I have a question now. Um, how do you think about uh, life theories without water? Uh, some theories say that sulfuric acid in high temperature and high pressure is a good solvent yeah. and the silicon played the role of carbon. Uh, what is your opinion for these theories about? So the theory, sorry, the theory that you can, you can, uh, you have these liquid solvents at very sort of extreme conditions compared to the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. I've seen some good arguments from very good chemists that you can do a lot of interesting chemistry, also polymerization chemistry, um, in liquid solvents at very extreme conditions that are not water. And uh, so I'm, I think I'm open to, to this possibility. Um, the thing I, I should say though is, even though these droplets that you're witnessing uh, are oil-based, they only function in water, right? So I'm not that far removed from conditions. I, I can do that experiment on this stage here because the conditions in this room are favorable to support this reaction. And the conditions I showed with these plates in the presentation that I made films of are also formed under these conditions. There's no special temperature or pressure conditions and that makes it easy to do the science, right? So um, I think there's a lot of room that could be um, explored based on sort of more extreme conditions that I don't think uh, most many people know about, but it could be done. I think it, there's a, there's a lot of uh, things to discover there. Thanks. Arkadaşlar, son sorumuz olsun. Buradan metamizesine gideceğiz zaten. Metamizesinde soru sormaya da devam edebiliriz bence. Hocamıza yaptığı sunum için çok teşekkür ederiz. Thank you.
DNA barkodlama yapılıyor bunda. Yani tüm e, taksonomik doğada var olan e, tüm türleri bir şekilde DNA tabanlı e, kategorize etmek istiyorlar. Barkodlama e, 2003'ten itibaren e, geliştirilen bir şey. Son dönemlerde farklı markerleri de dahil etmeye çalıştılar ama e, oldukça fazla kullanılıyor.